Well, first, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for everybody for your attention. This is work in progress that we're working with uh, Rich, that as you know, he was here until last February. So, um, you know, this work in progress, basically, obviously the title is dreadful and we will change it. Uh, believe me, we're, we're in the part of it, but you know, just for the record, like it is when we, we got it and basically it was established and then we didn't change it, so, okay. So we're gonna do a couple of things here. Uh, first, I'll go through why we study electron integrity. That should work, but doesn't. Uh, then we'll talk slightly about concepts and research design. Third, about results, and fourth, about conclusions. Now, what we are doing here today is trying to answer this question. Which part of the election process, or which parts of the election process, are more relevant for judging the integrity of, the elect of an election? And these is a question that uh, is not only theoretically interesting and unexplored, but also has very clear uh, policy-wise implications. Basically, when a lot of people go into uh, organizations, pour a lot of money into the elections, they put the election, they put this money, and they don't know, I mean, and they put it either for observing elections or afterwards or previously, but still we don't have a very clear account of when, where you should put your money at. Right, so basically, that's the first thing. Theoretically speaking, this is also an answer because, as you will see right now, a lot of the parts that have been dealt with it are just partially. I mean, part of these questions have been dealt with it partially, and I think that this is the first attempt to cover the whole question as an overall. Right, so this is what uh, this is the overall rationale. Uh, when talking to some people in some organizations, such as uh, the Organization for American States and everything, and, and others, they are always telling us, well, you know, we put the money, but still we don't know where, again, what is most cost effective and everything, so we still keep more or less doing the same thing. So basically, you see, you see what, what's the logic there, and this is what, what, we're trying, what we're trying to do. Now, traditionally, the factors driving the evaluation of, of elections have been deriving at three levels, all right? Uh, the state characteristics, the election characteristics, and the individual characteristics. I'm going to treat them very, 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 very fast right now. So regarding um, here, this uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with the works of well, my boss, who pays my salary, of people, and others like Sarah Birch and, and uh, Glasgow right now. Which what they are trying to do is well, basically saying okay, which are the determinants, which are the state determinants that that that, that define that will impact how the integrity of an election works, right? So, you know, in that regard, they would put uh, trade dependence, GDP, uh, you name it, right? They would put lots of other variables and they try to get it an, uh, an, an impact out of there. Regarding the individual characteristics, and this is less well explored, and this is why I think it's worth to mention the paper that we, that we got with Carly and got out right now, it's on Basically, if you look at a lot of the variables and a lot of the works that are done evaluating elections, so if you take Freedom House, if you take Quality, a lot of those are based on expert surveys, basically. Those are expert attempts. Normally, we don't know anything about those experts, so basically, when we work, we normally take Freedom House just for granted, and we say, okay, it's a seven, or it's a three, or it's whatever, and we just don't get anything. Even more, Freedom House, for instance, doesn't tell you where do these, which are the relevances, and which are the drivers that bring them to get a, to get a center, right? Now, in this paper that we have, we get, um, if you, uh, I'm assuming more or less you're familiar with what we're doing here. So basically what we do is analyze really into the individual level, which are the biases of our expert when we're evaluating the election. So basically we control for their ideology, for their knowledge, for the gender, not for education because all of them are PhDs, I mean, are already university professors, etc. right? But long story short, if you have to evaluate an election, it's also important to consider the individual characteristics that uh, of those who are making the, the, the judgment have. The final part here is on election characteristics, and here we may see uh, different works from different perspectives. So for lawyers, we'll have the legal, the legal, the legal side of it, and whether you know whether the election was following or you know adjusted to the law or did not adjust to the law. And on the other hand, we'll see the public administration perspective, right, which is also embedded. Again, there are many others that would go in here. Now the problem, or, well, not the problem, but the limitation are two or three. First, there is no study including everything. So 
We don't know whether the combination of state characteristic and election plus individuals who are giving the judgment, how do these matter for the election integrity? That's the first part. The second part is that we're dealing with this term, which I'm assuming that some of you still are not convinced with. And it's very simple, it's, it's, it's election integrity. And election integrity is multidimensional. Uh, you can define it either positively or negatively. So negatively what it's not, positively what it is. Negatively would be the examples of Sarah Birch. Okay, those are the violations. This is what shouldn't be. Positive is what people ask. Okay, this is how we define it. And the problem about that, and even more, is that it's besides it's multi. It's also multidimensional because, as I was saying, we're including a legal dimension. There's also an administrative dimension uh, or a bureaucratic dimension. But it's also it's also problematic because election integrity implies that you are covering the whole electoral cycle, right? So it's not only the lay that you are voting, but also the pre, so basically in the conditions in which you are going to be able to vote, and the afterwards, the reactions. How is this everything dealt, right? So the point here being, or why I'm saying all those things, is that regardless of the definition that we use, um, regardless of the definition that we use with electoral integrity, uh, it is going to be multidimensional. We would like to have all those to consider all of those all of those characteristics, given all the problems or all the possible uh, variances that, that that may be in at this level. All right. So, which is our point? Our point is that all of those we're going to test them all at the same time, and our point is going to be that here the dynamics, the, what is going on at the election level, is what is going to be most important uh, for the for the integrity. But here it's going to be election dynamics and I will talk about this in a in a second. Now I'm a bit lost. Um, so how do what do we mean by election dynamics? By election dynamics, we, what we're trying to mention or what we're trying to say is that uh, we would be trying everything that is going politically on the election, put it into, into an equation in that regard. Okay, so basically whether the election was free, whether the election was clean, whether the parties could compete without any sort of problematics, whether the count was done properly, whether uh, the EMB behave, uh, behave according to the law, whether the law was not shifting or was uh, bias in order to make life hard to the opposition, for instance. And normally this is what we're arguing is that this normally uh, is what is normally um, ignored, right? So the question is, how do election dynamics shape the conclusions about the overall, uh, about overall quality? And here is where we must put the cycle in. Our point is that we have, in order to give any sort of rating, we must include everything from what happened, and I'm just talking here about the election characteristics, right? about the election dynamics. We have to include the cycle. We have to include the pre, what happened before the election day, what happened during the election day, and what happened afterwards. Okay, this is very simple. And this is why here, where we show, uh, and this is why we have here uh, the four hypotheses where, where I get that um, we still need to work a bit more on, on their on their articulation uh, legally. This is what we're going to be measuring, very simple, very simply. As the election laws are increasingly favoring the incumbent, the election, the election integrity will decrease. And you can read the, the other ones, right? But the thing is that why this doesn't seem to be extremely attractive is because, or our argument is that the relevant literature so far, what they have focused is in one or two of the variables one of the hypotheses at, in isolation, okay? And we insist that we want to put everything into run, into test, okay? Um, why? Because again, the election integrity, the integrity of an election is shaped by everything that is going on. Again, pre, during, and after, okay? So this is, basically, those are going to be the four hypotheses that we're gonna be developing. We have them a bit more developed in the, in the paper, like, Granted, uh, grounded on the on the theory, but still, I think probably one of Dave's comments, although I shouldn't be advancing the critics, is that I would need, we would need probably to develop this a bit more. Now, let me go through the 
research design because I think it's going to be uh, interesting, or at least for you. We're going, to, so normally, there are two ways to test or that have been used for the, uh, to, rate the to rate the elections, right? Normally, we've been using either single index, single variables, all right, whether it was free and fair, one, zero, all right, or some other people have created indexes. Now, for instance, if you are like what we do, and this is what we do in our work, uh, or what we do, sorry, through the survey, is create these perceptions of electoral integrity index, in which we create everything, all the 49 variables that we have in order to create, sorry, all the 49 variables that we ask to our experts, they create the dependent variable, right? Now, the problem with that, and this is why we are getting out of this dependent variable, is that if you use those 49 variables to create an index, you are unable to use those variables to explain anything, right? Because once you have created the index, the utility is, is, is done, okay? Now, the good thing, though, is that what we have, uh, the other question, the other thing, the other approach could be, okay, you can guys take a single variable only and try to measure it. And this is what some other people have been doing in, in their works. But the problem with just one single variable is that it's limited because it's, you know, whether the election was free or fair, whether it worked properly or not. So it is kind of limited. Now, the thing is that what we're trying, or at least the argument is that we have this measure here, which is this question, which is just a rating question of the overall integrity by the end of the questionnaire. So we make all the questions about the integrity of the election to our experts, from 1 to 49. And at the end, we make them overall, on a 1 to 10 scale, how would you rate this election, right? Being 1, very low integrity, giving 10, high rated, high integrity, OK? The good thing being that is that as we have this question put at the end of the questionnaire, like people do respond whatever they want to put, and then they just give an overall evaluation. And being that we can ignore the index that we have created and that we have been published with, we just ignore that and just use this single value. value. Now, the good thing with that is that then we can use any of those 49 variables that we want in order to try to predict what, which are the predictors of the rating of integrity. Okay? Now, this is, I, we argue, uh, uh, right, the right way to go. And um, because we can make use of all the information that is in the survey of the experts, all of the responses, and this is the only way that we can think of in order to try to answer, to answer that question. So the other possibility, as I was mentioning, would, would be to use just uh, single variables. But again, the single variables just can go as far as, as they can go, right? And normally, it is unlikely that we're going to be able to find uh, so, de mm, so detailed surveys or surveys as, surveys as detailed with, with many questions as what we do have here. Um, our sample here, and um, it's, we're working with almost 1,200 experts. This is going to this is uh, growing right now by, by the moment as we we're speaking because we were sending the expert to the, the survey to other experts. But for the analysis, we're doing it for 91 elections in 85 countries. I know that in the end, in the panel in the paper says something different, but this is what it is. And the general method. No, I mean it's like because I was reading, I was like. Oh, uh, and then the method that we're using is overall is going to be this uh, multi effects, multi mix effects for the logic. Why are we using this one? Is because if you look at the distribution of the dependent variable, this is how, on average, our experts evaluate the integrity of the elections. All right, from one, so this is very very bad, to ten, very very good. And you know those are categories and they are independent. Sorry, they are they are overall categories, and we decided to go through this. We have received, or we have been suggested to use regression terms, but uh, I mean, it would be easier, honestly. So uh, we can we can try to do it like now. So we are clear with the dependent variable. Let's see about how we're going to operationalize our independent variable. So our stories are going to be here: uh, the five main election uh, level predictors. And they are measured on a five-point liquor scale, scale, so strongly disagree to strongly agree. And here, you guys, when you read it, have to 
check it out that you know if you, some voters threaten with violence at polls and strongly agree this is something negative, all right? Why if votes were counted fairly and this is strongly agreed is something positive. I mean, normatively speaking, but I guess that it, we're, we're, we're going to be in, in terms of agreement. Now, the good point of here is that we are covering all the election cycle. All right, we're covering what I was mentioning before, the pre, during, and after. And then we have an overall, but it was, we thought we should be included with this, whether the election authorities, authorities were impartial, given that they act before, during, and, and, uh, and, after, and after the election day. Okay? I'll show you a couple of graphs right now, which I think are relevant. This is how those are distributed. So what you have to read here is from strongly disagree, one to strongly agree, all right? And from one to 10, this is the rating scale, okay? So you see for the five independent variables that are we were looking at, at that are inter for interest of us, okay? So, uh, the stronger the people, I mean, the more the people agree that votes were counted uh, fairly, the higher on average you're going to see that there are devaluations, all right? So you see a correlation here. This is just by variates, okay? The only problem with this, or why is this with so many numbers, is because we have an ordinal attendance scale on the one hand, right? And on the other hand, we are having, uh, sorry, yes, we have an ordinal with 10, with 10 categories on the one hand, and then we have an ordinal with five categories here. So, you know, this is where we're observing different points at the different trends. And I know it's not extremely important, but, but in a sense, if you ignore that one, if you ignore votes, votes were counted fairly, you'll see that basically it shouldn't be much of a, of a, of a relationship. But again, this is a ordinal, ordinal relationship, so, sorry, ordinal variables, and then the relationship should be understood in, different, in a different way. So those are the ones that we're going to be including. The second part are going to be our, or the controls that we're going to be using, are going to be both, as I was mentioning before, at the state level as an, and the expert of the individual level, all right? So at the state level, we're going to be using the GDP per capita in constant terms since 2005, that's the standard in the literature, and this is what uh, you've seen Birch and uh, also in PIPAS for, and some others. We're also using logarithm of population. Then the numbers of years since polity four changed. Polity four, I'm assuming that everybody knows what is here, but it's like the very similar of Freedom House. So if you don't have Freedom House, you can use polity. It doesn't matter what, which one we use, but just the changes, all right? So if it changes from six to a seven, etc. Whether you have an ongoing civil conflict, because we're arguing well, but if you're voting well while you have uh, people shooting at each other <coughs> in the same country, that's gonna be problematic. And then the number of elections held since 1945, or, in, or independent, depending on the country, which for all of those who are familiar with the issue, this goes with the Lindbergh argument, all right? So almost all of the arguments that were, all of the independent variables are relying or are using some of the logic already sketched out in, in the literature, okay? At the individual level, so basically this is going to be at the expert level, we're going to use whether the, if, whether the expert is domestic or international. The argument being that maybe domestic guys have a better or a worse uh, attitude toward evaluating their own election than the foreigners. The familiarity with the elections in this country, in such countries. So basically in the survey, the question is whether how familiarized you are with the elections in this country. And you would be surprised, like a lot of people mean like, Granted, around 70% of the people locate themselves between 8 and 10, but still you have some people that are going to the left on the 6 and 5, right? So this is, this is also fairly, fairly scattered. Ideology, because you may say, I mean, although probably in the internal chain emails we can see something different, but probably uh, left guys are maybe more critical than right wing guys, or maybe the other way around with the territory of the election, so why not controlling for that? The age by decade, okay, so whether all the guys are more or less critical for the election and whether they are gender, uh, well, sorry, whether they are male or female. Now the thing here is, what I want to stress is that this is good in the following sense. When we're using other expert data, such as, again, Freedom House or Polity or something, we don't have any, other, any, any of these things. No. 
And so basically it is good to be able to control for those individual characteristics. All right. Now, also, given that, and for those of you who have not the background in the survey, because obviously I think sometimes right, we are too much in ourselves. So the survey has 49 questions about how the election went. We're covering the pre-cycle, the pre-election cycle, the cycle, or the day of the election, and the after the election, all right? And there are other, and as I said, there are 49. So we have to decide which other variables we were going to include. Now, obviously, as you may think, if we have our dependent variable rating, and then we have 49 variables, and we present anything similar, like, you know, the table will have at least 50, 50 lines, right? So we'll be unreadable. That's the first thing. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe already it's into snooze time. Um, the other part is, so the question is, how do we define or how we do decide how we how did we decide uh, what sort of other variables to include from the, our question? All right, given that it's so rich, how we did it? How did we do it? So basically, the 49 variables can be um, organized into 11 dimensions. And what we did was simply, and this is completely inductively, we were running the models for each of one of these dimensions over rating, okay? So for dimension number one, dimension number two, dimension number three, we were running it over the dependent variable. And if that variable was significant, we may say, okay, this, this may be a story here, so we want to include, we don't want to omit it, okay? So we, this is what we did, we included it. The other thing that we, um, and those were the ones that were uh, shown statistically significant, and they are included in the model, all right? In the models, we run three sort of types, but here, just for the record, I'm going to present two, because this is the most important thing. And we're not presenting numbers for two reasons. First, just with five, 12. So basically, with 20 or so, it would be a really ugly uh, table. Normally, tables are ugly per definition, but you know I think this is clear. So, what we need is two things. Well, we estimated three models, but the two important ones here are four and th three and four. Now, model three, it's only including the variables that we argue that make sense, the ones that I showed you the hypothesis previously, and it's in red, okay? And then model four includes all of those, the variables that we said that make sense, plus those that we found in the inductive analysis tomorrow, all right? Now, how this table has to be read, this is really simple. It is the following. The line, if the arms of the coefficient, so this is the coefficient, this is the standard error. So if the standard error touches the zero, this implies that the variable is not relevant to explain the integrity the evaluation, okay? So basically, this means that voters threatened with violence, it is relevant. Okay, while fair access to media is not relevant in model four, but it's relevant in model three, basically because we are including model. Okay, so now what you can see is, and we're just going to be mentioning model four, is that out of the four variables, sorry, the five variables that we're including, four of them happen to work properly, I mean, happen to be significant and in the expected direction. So basically, if voters are, if votes are counted fairly, you are expecting a higher rating of the integrity, sorry, a higher, a higher integrity of the election. If laws favor incumbent, lower, makes sense. Uh, voters are then with violence, negative, so everything goes expected to, according to expectations, okay? When we look at model four, including those variables that we were not originally including, we were not saying anything in the paper. Matters, election officials are, fair, are important, register was inaccurate, is important. Again, everything goes in according, according to what should be expected and, and seem to be holding. But those three variables that we mentioned before that tested to be positive, sorry, that tested to be significant, are not right now. The third part, is the state characteristics. Remember that we were saying about what other people have been doing, so this is what we've been done. And so the previously, so for instance, 
uh, Lindbergh argument, Lindbergh's, Stefan Lindbergh's argument about the number of elections that you had doesn't matter. All right, so basically his argument is the more elections you will have, the, the more integrity or the better the elections will be. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. GDP, not surprisingly here, works, and this goes in accordance to what anybody, a lot of other people has found. Population doesn't, institutional stability, the years that you can have more percent seems to be seems not to be significant or very much in the margins. And ongoing civil conflict, and this is kind of surprising, doesn't in the fourth model. Okay? Finally, is and this would this this is also important here, is to know about the characteristics of the experts. Now, if we find characteristics of the experts to be significant, that would be something that by which we should take cautiously, or at least we should be uh, warning when we're using the expert service. Not that we're expert service, by the way, but all the expert service, all right? But here, so in model four, we have whether domestics or experts. So if you are a, a domestic expert, you are more likely to be a bit critical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically this is pointing out that our expert survey here, like our domestic guys are a bit more critical than, than the others. And the rest seems to be, all right, seems to be here non-significant, which again is something good, not only for the database, but also for the results that we're finding, okay? And again, I want to stress this, uh, in other expert surveys that you find around, that, that you find, uh, that you use, normally there is no analysis of who are the people, the characteristics of, of our evaluators. So I think it is important to mention. Now, the final part that we've done are two things. First, we have done predictive probabilities because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, the, quest, the question we try to answer is which part of the cycle is more important. So basically, if you have to put the money, where do you have to invest it as NDI or IDEA or whomever? And so here, what we did was just changing, again, the integrity rating from 1 to 10, and the changes from 1 to 5 to <coughs> the significant independent variables that we measured. All right? Um, overall, we find here that you have a 571% increment of changing, of improving the, the rating of your, of your election if you have impartial officials, if you change from impartial officials to non-impartial officials, but the funny thing, or, you know, it is better, you may observe this better graphically, and here you can see how just changing this increases, increases the likelihood of being, so basically the story here, or the punchline would be, or how would I explain this in other places, would be that what we need, or, you know, the more so when the expert perceives that the elections officials are impartial, the ratings tend to be higher. So long story short would be, if you need to invest money, try to make that your uh, election officials are impartial. Now, this obviously is not very <coughs> bad breaking. I mean, this goes with common sense and everything. The question would be, okay, well, first of all, these are perceptions. So one thing is that to be perceived, they don't necessarily need to be, but they need to be perceived. And the other question would be, okay, how you do that? But again, this is not our, uh, our, um, our work yet. So conclusions. Uh, in the models, election dynamics trump election, uh, sorry, state and individual characteristics. So in other words, the election dynamic that goes on really matter and must be included, all right? And then finally, Elections official impartiality has the largest average effect across outcome categories, which is the final graph that you've seen that it's really, really high there. So we think this is fair. I mean, it goes very well with uh, common sense. But obviously, this is not uh, finished, and this is why we're here. We need some, or we have some ideas about how to uh, improve, but we are looking for comments. Like first, I think we need to. Well, we think we need to focus the causal story. The sections where we're including our hypothesis, we still need to strengthen that part. The second that part. The second part is to estimate better uh, the expert originality. And basically, here what we're thinking in the survey, there are some vignettes. There are three vignettes. And basically, a vignette for those of you who are not familiar, it is really simple is how I make sure, how we make sure that a Spanish guy understands 
a seven in the same way that does a Senegalese guy, right? So basically, same problems in different countries, in different contexts, may be understood really, really differently. So a way to assess for that is through vignettes. We still are working on that. We still haven't finished, but this would be a, a future, a future way to to proceed. The other part is going to be obviously diversified and use other uh, other data sources because so far we've been using PEI and also we've been using well then the other coverage for states, but this is not relevant. And then really suggesting to diversify methodology and using. Uh, Extreme bounds, but I'm not going to into that because I'm still working in the other part. So with that, uh, I think it's been a lot of time, and looking forward to it. Thank you.